Good morning once again, everybody. If you could be written into any story or any book ever written, what book would you choose? I happen to have mentioned a few times lately about rereading Lord of the Rings over recent months, but I wouldn't want to be a character in any, any of those books. That would be a terrible ordeal to be part of. Personally, I'm not very heroic. I'm just a very normal, average person, or maybe some would say abnormal and below average person. I would not want to be given the role that Frodo or Gandalf or Aragorn or anybody else had. Maybe some random sh hobbit shire, shire hobbit who had no idea what was going on in the broader world. That'd be more my role. Although even in the books, they have a hard time at the end, though the movies skip that part. I also kind of like whodunit books, mystery kind of books, or books with trials and, and lawyers, but I don't think I'd want to be in one of those stories or one of those books either. At least I wouldn't want to be the one on trial. I like the Chronicles of Narnia. That's a great series. Many people, everybody loves those. Maybe it would be neat to be in one of those books. What kind of book or story would you like to be in? Maybe you'd like to be in a sports book where the person wins the championship at the end or, or maybe some cozy book where it's just all smooth sailing and there's no suspense and ups and downs. It's just this very simple, everything happy kind of book if there is such a thing. Sometimes I feel that right here, right now in the year 2020, we're living in some sort of a, a strange story written by H.G. Wells or something and maybe we're coming out to the tail end of it, maybe, but then there keeps being kind of hiccups uh, along the way. But there's one book that I'd really like to be written into, I'd like my name in, and I'd like my name to be never blotted out of it, and that is The Book of Life. And the You Asked For It sermon topic this morning is a sermon on the book of life. Someone asked, could you explain what it exactly it is? So let's uh, open the sermon in prayer before going any further, and then we'll get into the book of life. Lord Jesus, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for the wonderful gospel-centered songs that we could sing together and for this opportunity to discuss the book of life and to take part in the Lord's table together. Lord, we pray that you'd uh, encourage our, our hearts and, uh, and minds and spirits this morning through your word and through these passages on the book of life. Thank you, Lord God, for writing us into your story, the great story of redemption. You are the greatest storyteller ever. You've made an incredible story of redemption, the real history of the world, and to be part of it is a, is a wonderful privilege, and we give you thanks, and I pray that you would open our, our hearts to, uh, to see and believe this morning. Amen. The Book of Life is not a storybook like Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia, but it does pertain to the greatest story ever told, the one that spans all of time. God's story of redemption. And the Book of Life, it's actually a book, well actually rather than just explain it offhand, we're going to look up the passages and have kind of a Bible study sermon together. You're going to look them up with me, I hope, and we'll take them one at a time, six passages, and they'll tell us what exactly the book of life is. Six passages that mention the book of life, one from Philippians and several from Revelation. So number one, Philippians 4 verses 1 to 3. Go ahead and turn to these with me if you would like to, and you can find things fairly fast. Once you're in Revelation, it'll be very easy to find the next ones, because it'll just be flipping a few pages each time. But there's one reference early on here in Philippians, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, where we read, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So if this was the only passage we, could, we had in the Bible about the book of life, we could start to figure out pretty clearly that the book of life is a book that people's names who, who serve the Lord are, are in. People who are believers in Christ and therefore work. He says, my fellow workers, mentions Clement, mentions Euodia and Syntyche who are, are uh, fellow believers and fellow workers. He's actually in the context there. He's asked them to get along and, and agree and be united together because they've had some sort of a disagreement or, uh, or some sort of division there, but even during that time, their names are written in the book of life. Now let's go on to Revelation. First Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. 
passage that I preached on uh, maybe about a year ago when doing the letters to the churches in Revelation. Revelation 3, 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet... You have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. From this passage, we can figure out that whoever conquers, those who, are, those who are true believers, who, who endure to the end, they will never have their names blotted out of the book of life. Now that phrase does lead people to wonder, well, are there some people that do have their name blotted out of the book of life and, and others who don't, like maybe everyone's in the book of life to begin with, but some get blotted out along the way, or maybe your name gets written down when you become a believer in Christ, but if you become an unbeliever, you kind of like a non, go back to being a non-Christian, lose your salvation, if that's possible, then would your name get blotted out of the book of life? And I don't think either of those possibilities are correct. I think only true believers have their names written down in the book of life and then once you're a true believer your name will never be blotted out of the book of life. You will never lose your salvation or get blotted out. After all this passage doesn't actually say some people get their name blotted out of the book of life. It actually says they don't. Those that endure to the end, those that are true believers don't get their names blotted out. It It talks about people not getting blotted out and it doesn't go on to say unlike those other people whom I will blot out. It doesn't say that. It just says simply, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and will never blot, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. To me, that indicates that all true believers will never have their name blotted out of the book of life. It's God's way of saying that he will never let go of those who truly believe in him. They will endure, they will conquer, they will not have their names blotted out of the book of life. Next passage, flip a few pages forward to Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 to 8. Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 to 8. Good to see some people flipping pages there in their Bible. Some people playing on their phones as well, which is great as long as it's the Bible app you have open and you flip the head in your Bible app, that's great. Revelation 13, 5 to 8. And the beast was given a month uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemes against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in earth. And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Christians usually think the beast spoken of here is the Roman Empire and Roman Emperor or perhaps a future world leader or or often people think both. It's kind of a a type and anti-type and and foreshadowing of the future as well. For our purposes today, either way, what we can learn from from this passage about the book of life is that those people whose names are in the book of life actually had their names written there before the foundation of the world. Did you notice that in verse 8? And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, though they're going to worship the beast, everyone that except, it says everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. The only people who don't worship the beast are the true Christians described in this passage as the ones who had their name written in the book of life before the foundation 
of the world. We're actually going to see that again now if you flip the page over to Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. I thought of reading several verses from Revelation 17, but I don't have time to try to explain much of Revelation 17 this morning. So we'll just zero in on the one verse here, Revelation 17, verse 8. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. So from this passage... Similarly to Revelation chapter 13, we read that those who marvel at or those who love the beast are the people whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. So once again, if your name is written in the book of life because you are a true believer in Christ, you've repented of your sins, believed that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sin, this verse says your name didn't actually get written down in the book of life the moment that you believed. It actually was written down in the book of life from before the foundation of the world. Before the beginning of the world, God had written your name down in the book of life. This concept kind of blows people's minds and they struggle with it sometimes, but it, it is right here in two passages before the foundation of the world, this teaching that God knew who was going to believe before the foundation of the world. People start wondering sometimes then, well, do people really have a choice? Is it actually free will to choose to believe? But certainly God tells people to repent of their sins and, and believe and they need to choose to do that. But the Bible also says that once people choose to believe, they sh should realize that actually all along God knew the end from the beginning. He stands outside of time. He knew exactly who was going to believe and who was not going to believe. And he'd already written down your name in the book of life if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Next passage. Flip the page. One more page there over to Revelation chapter 20. Verses 7 to 15, we'll read the, the larger context here, and we'll hear about the book of life at the very end of it as well. Revelation 20, verses 7 to 15. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So from this passage on the book of life, we can know that anyone whose name is not found written in the book of life ends up thrown into the lake of fire. The same lake of fire from verse 10 that the devil got thrown into in verse 10 and where the beast and false prophet already were by that point, which it describes as a place of torment forever and ever because being away from God's presence would be the worst, most terrible reality to face forever and ever. And that's the reality for those whose names are not written in the book of life. Next, the final passage that mentions the book of life. Flip over to Revelation chapter 21. And we'll be talking about the book of life while talking about the new Jerusalem and the new earth. If you read the King James Version of the Bible, you might think that I'm missing one reference from Revelation chapter 22. However, I believe that the translation of Revelation chapter 22 verse 19 should say tree of life, not 
book of life and that the error springs from a scribal error that got into the Texas Receptus. And if you're interested in that topic, I could give you more information later on, but won't get into that today other than to say that's why if you're thinking, well, isn't there one more reference? No, it, it should say tree of life there. I'm, uh, that's what I, I believe and, uh, and I think most people believe nowadays. Certainly no offense intended to the King James wonderful translation. Many people may use that around here and that's great. But uh, after the publication of the King James, there were earlier manuscripts found, more reliable manuscripts, and they all say tree of life in that verse, not book of life. So I think Revelation 21 verses 22 to 27 is the last reference in the Bible to the book of life. Let's read together. Revelation 21, 22 to 27. It says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So from this passage, we learn that all, the only people who make it to heaven, which in the end is ultimately the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem, are those people whose names are written in the book of life. So putting all of these passages about the book of life together, we can know from God's word that the book of life is a record that God keeps of the names of all people who will be with him forever in heaven because of their faith in Jesus Christ. If your name is written down in the book of life, it will never be erased from the book of life because your name was actually written there before the foundation of the world because God knew who would come to believe and had already written their names down in the book of life. So to start moving into kind of the application of this sermon, the application is, is very simple. I want to ask you, are you sure that your name is written down in the book of life? Everybody wants to go to heaven someday, but only those people whose names are written down in the book of life are going to be with Christ forever in heaven. Many people seem to think that they could get to heaven if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds, but the Bible is very clear that is not how you get to heaven. It doesn't have to do with good deeds outweighing bad deeds. It has to do with accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. John 1 verse 12 says that those who receive Jesus by believing in him become children of God. It's by receiving Jesus that you become a part of God's family. Romans 3 verses 23 to 25 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. When this verse and others say that Christ Jesus was a propitiation for our sins to be received by faith, it's teaching that salvation is by faith and that we can be saved through faith in Jesus because he was our propitiation. Propitiation is a big word. I know we got kids here. That's probably a big word for you. I know we got adults here. It's probably a big word for you as well. But it's a big word with a big meaning. And it means that Jesus died in our place for our sins. And in doing so, he took the punishment of the wrath of God that our sins deserved. Therefore, we can be fully forgiven of our sins and even adopted into God's family, become children in God's family because Jesus died in our place and he paid the penalty for our sins. That's what propitiation means. The great Canadian theologian and author J.I. Packer recently passed away and went to glory and he once wrote, speaking of forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ, this great quote, saying, Adoption is the highest privilege of the gospel. The traitor is forgiven and brought in for supper and given the family name. To be right with God the judge is a great thing. To be loved and cared for by God the Father is even greater. Once you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, 
You've truly repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' death on the cross to save you. From that point forward, God doesn't just barely put up with you and just barely tolerate you, even though he can still hardly stand you, but he'll just kind of sort of put up with you and may give you a few little crumbs off of his table and just begrudgingly barely forgive your sins. No, no. God loves you and he adopts you into his family. He becomes your loving heavenly father. You become his son or daughter. You become his child. You go from being an enemy of God to seated at his table and he knew it all along and had your name written down in the book of life because he loves you. In our country, when a child gets adopted, there's a written record of it. The child's name gets written on an adoption certificate, legal proof that an adoption has taken place. In the case of the gospel, God pardons the guilty sinner and adopts him or her into the family all in the same instant and the record that a person has been pardoned and adopted is the book of life. And it didn't take God by surprise and then he quickly wrote down the name when you believed he actually had your name written there all along. And that's the record. When Jesus sent out the 72 disciples in uh, Luke chapter 10, they came back rejoicing, saying that it was amazing that even they had power over demons that Jesus had given to them there in that time in Luke chapter 10. They were rejoicing. They came back but what they were able to do. And Jesus says in Luke chapter 10 verse 20, Never, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. To have your name written down in heaven means to be written down in the Lamb's book of life, the record in heaven. And that is the greatest privilege or joy that we could ever have, to have our names written down in heaven, written down in the Lamb's book of life. We don't earn our salvation and get into that book of life by doing good works and earning it in any way, shape, or form. We are saved purely by God's grace because of the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. So God gets all the credit and all the glory and then we live to glorify God for his grace both now and for all of eternity. Some people might think, well, if salvation is, is purely by grace and we don't earn it in any way, and we don't have to work for it, won't people be lazy then, and they'll, they'll just live for themselves, and, and they won't live for God if that's not what helps to save them? Shouldn't people commit their lives to doing good works, and it, wouldn't that help if that was kind of part of what saves them? But the answer is, certainly, God's children should absolutely commit their lives to doing good works that glorify God and bless other people, and certainly true Christians do that. But we do that because we are saved already by God's grace and we want to please him and we want to obey him. We do it because we're saved, not to try to get saved. We don't earn our salvation with our good works. Salvation is a free gift and then we do good works because we're saved by grace through faith. If someone claims to believe in Jesus but does no good works and just lives their life completely selfishly for themselves, then the Bible would certainly say their lack of good works and their lack of fruit is a clear indication of a false profession of faith and that person is not a true Christian because true Christians get a heart transplant. When they believe, they get a new heart and that heart wants to obey God, wants to glorify God, wants to be committed to doing good work, serving God and, and serving others. But we serve him because we're saved, not to try to get saved. We glorify him not to get saved, not to earn our salvation, but because we are saved by grace through faith and we love him and we want to glorify him because we have a new heart. And one of the ways that we glorify God's name and praise him for his grace is by setting time apart to take part in the Lord's Supper. And after thinking about the book of life and the gospel this morning, let's take part in communion in just a few moments after reading together from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians 11 as we, where we often read before taking part in the Lord's Supper. We read about how Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on the night of his crucifixion and how the church should eat and drink in a special way to remember his atoning death on the cross. 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 29 says, for I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, meaning this represents my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 25, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Meaning this cup represented his blood and the establishment of the new covenant of salvation by grace through faith and the death of Christ. So then he says, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So in just a moment, let's take a full minute, a full 60 seconds to quietly examine our hearts before the Lord as this passage says. Examine your faith. Make sure that you have saving faith in Jesus Christ. Think about the book of life and examine and ask, is my name truly written down in there because of repenting of sin and trusting in the Savior? Is my name written down in heaven? If it is, you take part in communion with us in a moment. If it's not, you could just observe because this is for believers to take part in. And then as you're examining yourself, confess sin, give thanks to, to the Lord Jesus Christ for dying on the cross to pay for your sin and forgive you. So let's take a, a full 60 seconds just of self-examination and reflection and examining the cross and thinking about today's sermon before we go into taking part in the elements. Amen. Thank you for taking that moment of silence, even the children. We appreciate that. At this point, we'll, uh, let's just open up the cracker package if you haven't already. And in, in a moment, I'll just ask one of the elders, maybe I'll ask Tim just to pray from where you are in just a moment after everyone's opened up their crackers. And then we'll end up, you can break a piece off or eat a cracker as a symbol of the body of Christ broken for us. So if you haven't already opened, go ahead and just uh, open that up. And you can break a piece off. Looks like everybody, most people have gotten it opened. And uh, Tim, could I just ask you from where you are just to maybe stand so people can hear you and just pray and just give thanks to the Lord Jesus for his uh, body broken for us. Amen. Let's partake together of this token symbolizing the body of Christ broken for us. And then at this point, let's take a, just take a moment to open up your juice box. And once we've done that, I'll ask Todd if he could, from where you are, Todd, just stand and pray in just a moment for, for us giving thanks for the blood of Christ shed for us, which this juice is a, is a symbol of. 
we'll just give give people a moment there to finish your chewing your cracker and uh, to open up your juice box. Thanks for bearing with us for this unconventional Lord's table. While we don't have those uh, new elements to pass out, hopefully we'll have those by next month. Let's uh, looks like everybody's got them open mainly. Let's uh, just ask Todd to to pray and give thanks for the blood of Christ shed for us. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Let's partake of a sip of juice symbolizing the blood of Christ shed for us. Amen. Let's close in prayer and then I'll leave you with a closing Bible verse benediction. Heavenly Father, once more we pray to you. And we say thank you so much. Thank you, Lord God, for your great story of redemption and for writing us who are believers into your story and for even doing that before you even began the whole creation. It's just just amazing, blows our mind to think of your love. Thank you, Lord, that you don't just barely put up with us once we believe in you, but that you actually love us and adopt us into your family and just thank you for your grace. It's a free gift. We we receive it by faith and we rejoice in it by faith now and every day. And so thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for our church family, the opportunity to gather together here as well as uh, virtually there on Facebook and the many people taking part in the Lord's table with us as well in that way. And Lord, we, we give you praise for the, for the cross, for your love, for adoption into your family. We could never say thank you enough, but we do say thank you once more. And uh, we commit the rest of this day to you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to you in closing, same verse I read last month after communion. I love this verse, Romans 15, verse 13, as a closing benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen? Amen. If you are dismissed, please finish up your juice or crackers or toss them out there at the back. Don't leave them on your table, but take them with you as you uh, leave in the, in the coming 10 or 15 minutes.